<laughs> it's good to continue this series. I'm enjoying this series. It's reminding me of a lot of things that I need to be reminded of. The fruit of the Spirit. That is basically our life's goal. If we would do nothing else in this dear book but to live out the fruits of the Spirit in our life, guess what? We would be a success. Because a lot is caught through showing people how we should live by the Spirit. And the way we do that is by emulating the fruit that are mentioned in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. Told you you're going to memorize this by the time we get done. Every week been reading the same portion. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Last week we talked about kindness. How many of us have tried to be kind with somebody this week? How many failed at trying to be kind? You don't have to raise your hands on that. It's easy to fail at being kind, just act in your human nature. Allowing the Holy Spirit to take over that human nature is the call of ours. We talked about the root word of both kindness and goodness, which is Christotes. It means a sense of doing what is right or righteous. It's, it's the kindness of heart or act, not merely goodness as a quality. Rather, it's goodness in, in action per se. It's the why of why we do something. Why am I going to do this? Do I want to be kind or unkind? That's what kindness was. It answered the question, why? It was the kindler disposition towards others. You can see some stories about being kind with others. If you look at the story of the penitent woman that came before Jesus and basically wet his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And one of the Pharisees said, if you were really a prophet, you'd know what kind of woman she is. And Jesus already knew it didn't matter. He was being what? Kind. It's kind of like the woman that was actually caught in adultery. Caught in a dirty act and probably thrown in front of Jesus. And after he wrote something in the sand and he looked at the people around him and he said, ye without sin, why don't you be the first to cast the first stone? And they all just dropped their stones and left. We all know that the act that she performed was what? Wrong. But Jesus showed kindness because that was his inward nature. That was Christotes being offered to both of those people. However, with goodness, sometimes, I've learned this when we're raising children, sometimes you can't always be kind with your kids. You have to be good with your kids. This is kind of like when Christ went into the tabernacle one particular day and they were basically ripping people off. What was happening was these people would bring monies from other countries into the tabernacle because they didn't have a sacrifice to offer to God and they would have to exchange their currency for temple currency to be able to buy a sacrifice to offer to the Lord. What was going on then, what really angered Jesus, was that they were ripping people off on the currency rates. They were stealing from people of God, making a profit, just so others could offer up a sacrifice. That angered Christ. You have made my house a den of thieves. Now Jesus wasn't too kind at that point. 
that's goodness. That comes from the word agathosuna. And that means it's more of a, a what. It's what I do. Is what you do good? Sometimes as young people or even old people, we run into this thing where we need to be good, but it's hard to do what's good, even though you have to. I'll never forget the first time I, oh, I probably shouldn't say this. Oh, I wait, they're old. I don't want to get sued now. But I remember the first time I had to spank my kids. How many got spanked when you were younger? Oh, you all were abused. And look at you, you're all in the house of God. And I'll tell you, I remember the first time you had to do that. I remember your parents used to say it hurts more me more than it does them. Well, I'll tell you one thing. My, nobody got spanked by my dad because he hurt you. He, had a, he put you right over the lazy boy thing. And man, we have a, I still have the paddle on my refrigerator. It was a pine paddle about this long. About that wide. And it's still up there. And my kids wanted to, they were fighting over who was going to get it to raise their kids. Well, if you do that now, they'd be calling authorities. But see, sometimes as parents, you have to do what's good. And it's not always kind. Sometimes when we make decisions in life and we're out with our friends we're living beside our neighbors. We're at work. And we got all these eyes watching us. We have to make a decision. And we have to do something that's good. But it's not always easy to do. And they perceive it as being unkind. Today we call it, in our political, we call it being politically incorrect. Being insensitive. And this is, this is so confusing in the culture in which we live. You would think goodness would be praised and sin would be debased, but no, it's not. It's like sin is being praised now. Let's have a whole month of June and celebrate sin. It just doesn't make sense to me. But sometimes Agathosune has to come out goodness. Jesus did not like looking at the sin of people, and he still doesn't today, and he still wants holiness in our lives. That's the goodness I'm talking about. Kindness is how we deal with others, being kind with others, even when they don't deserve it, just like Jesus demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet Sinners, he died for us. That's kindness, but his goodness says, if you ask for forgiveness, you can be a child of mine. But when you do that, I want you to live by the Spirit. And here's what I want you to do. And he gives us his word and says, I want you to follow this, for these are the words of life. This is your daily bread. But there's some hindrances to goodness. It's in your notes. One of them is just a sinful nature. Sinful nature. Why do we not do good all the time? Because it says in Psalm 51.5, that in sin, my, in sin my mother conceived me from the very womb we were born with a sinful nature. It says in Romans 3, 9 and 10, that there's no one righteous. No, not one. And we live in a world today that everybody goes to heaven. Everybody's righteous. Only the horribly bad ever go to hell. And the word says the exact opposite. We are all sinners. None of us were born righteous. We have to ask for God's righteousness. So sinful nature is a hindrance. Second thing is peer pressure. Peer pressure. Sometimes... And I found out from getting older, I used to, when I was a youth, peer pressure was a thing way back then too. And I found out, it makes no difference how old I get, there's peer pressure. The temptations just change. 
They really do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 33 and 34, it says, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning, for to your shame I say that some of you don't know God at all. It's pretty direct. Just stop it. Sometimes that's the only advice we need to give ourselves. Just stop it. When you see yourself doing something that's not good, just stop it. And when you hang around people that constantly influence you in a bad way, you need to step away from them. There's nothing unbiblical about that. Nothing unbiblical about that. Because I guarantee what will happen is this. If you step away and get strong in the Lord, you'll get strong in the Lord. Eventually, you'll be a blessing to the person you just left because you'll get strong in your faith. A true friend does not cause your demise. A true friend builds you up, strengthens you. A true friend don't say, hey, let's go over here and do this or do that. Let's get in some trouble. See how much trouble we can get in. That's not a true friend. Let's get together and let's talk about people. Let's get together and let's chat online and let's debase this person over here we don't know a thing about. That's not a friend. Peer pressure can cause you to do all kinds of things. Cultural pressure. That's what we're facing today. Cultural pressure. Culture's trying to tell us what to believe. You need to do this, and if you don't, we're going to, and they'll fill in a blank. And there's corporations doing that, and they're losing money left and right because they're trying to be culturally correct. Just sell your product. Don't tell me how to believe, and that's what culture's doing today. This is how we should believe, right here. But culture will do that. And it's really tough right now. And living in this culture, I think I was a teenager at a good time. I don't know if I'd want to go back. In fact, I know I wouldn't want to go back and be 15 again. I wouldn't. I'm, I'm happy with being 60 years old. I really am. I'm at a good spot right now. Yeah, I know I got more years behind me and in front of me, but that's okay because my eternity is going to be wonderful. But the pressures that young people deal with today so much different than what we dealt with. Amen. Cover them in prayer. The next thing, hindrance to goodness is laziness. Just, just sheer laziness. We just don't feel like it. It's amazing what Scripture says about laziness. I did a study on that. You know, the Lord just does not take too kindly to lazy people. It's really amazing when you read it. It says in verse, verse 11 of Romans 12, it says, uh, Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Paul told us in another one of his letters, it says, just be reminded that um, if you don't work, you probably shouldn't eat. Laziness is not something that God looks down and says, well, that's good. Nothing wrong with retirement, but just to sit back and say, I really don't care about doing anything at all anymore. Whether it be for the Lord, for my family, I don't want to do it. It's just, and that leads to the last one. It was be apathy. This is the I don't care attitude. I just don't care and it's a shame when people feel this way. In a little book called Zephaniah, I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. I should have marked this one because this is a book I don't go to all the time. I know it's in the Old Testament. It's here somewhere. When it talks, oh, here it is. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It says, so their property will be plundered. Oh, wait, it says, I will search with lanterns in Jerusalem's darkest corners to punish those who sit complacent in their sins. They think the Lord will do nothing to them, either good or bad. So their property will be plundered, their homes will be ransacked, 
land. They will build new homes but never live in them. They will plant vineyards but never drink wine from them. Apathy, doing nothing, being complacent, having I don't really care. It doesn't affect me. How many times have you heard that? Well, if it really doesn't affect me, I don't care what you do. Every sin that affects you affects us. You realize that? Sin spreads like a cancer. Who would have thought just a few years ago we'd be discussing and arguing whether this or that was wrong on the news? I, I, I never thought there would be a day when we'd be questioning the gender of a child. I don't want to get political, but that's just, it just dumbfounds me. It just dumbfounds me. It's like when a child's born, what do, they, what do they tell you the first thing? Is it a boy or a girl? It's real easy to tell. I'm not going into an anatomy lesson today. Pretty easy to tell. But we question that. Who would have? I can't believe it. It just dumbfounds me that I can just wake up someday and I can say, well, I don't want to be a guy anymore. I'm going to, but that's what we have going on in this culture. Apathy, goodness is out the window. Do what I want to do. That's the hindrance to goodness. And if we as Christians don't stand up and say, this is right and this is wrong, who do we have left to do that? We are to be salt and light. I have found out Working for 20 years at Craftmate, everybody knew me as a resident preacher. They'd come to church just to see me at Cortland dressed in a suit rather than jeans and a t-shirt. And it was hilarious because they couldn't spell church normally. But when their life went upside down, guess who they'd come see? I'm telling you something. It was a blessing this week to see all those young people at church because that has to happen in this country. It's wonderful to look over here and see young people, especially young people who want to sit up in the front row with me. It's like, this old man sitting with me? I think it's kind of nice having young people around here. We have young people in our youth that come here on Thursday for a youth meeting, but perhaps worship at another church on Sundays, but they like this youth group, they come here on Thursdays to worship with us. It's an amazing thing. Apathy. Facts about goodness. First of all, God is full of goodness. God is full of goodness. When you look at uh, Psalm 34, and verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. All the joys of those who take refuge in him. If you go to Psalm 86, 5. Oh Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. It's amazing when you look. God is the very nature of goodness. But with that goodness comes holiness. He expects that of his people. He is merciful, forgiving, he's kind, but we don't talk about the justice of God very much. He's a just God. How many of us would like an unjust judge? We don't like that. But we want an unjust judge when it rules in our favor. See, we go out there and plant seeds of discord and then we ask God for crop failure. And it doesn't work that way. Life is not always fair. We say, I'm going to sow these seeds of discord. Oh, Lord, please bless me. I didn't really mean it. But you know, we reap what we sow. And a just God will say, well, in my word it says, God cannot be mocked. Do not be, be deceived. A man will reap what he sows. That's justice. It's important what seeds we plant in life. 
Another thing is God is good to us. If you go to Psalm 84, Psalm 84, it's a great chapter. You could read the whole psalm and, and, and enjoy the whole thing, but the key is in verse 5. If you look at Psalm um, 84, the key says, What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord. And it says, How lovely is your dwelling place. Even the sparrows find a home. What joy for those who live in your house. And it keeps talking about things that the Lord does that's so good to us. God is good to us. The very breath we're breathing right now is because of his mercy and grace. Facts, another fact about goodness, we are to be full of goodness. If we're to emulate God, why shouldn't we be good? If he calls us to be filled with the Spirit and have the fruit of goodness, why would he expect any less from us? We talked about kindness and the why last week, but most people, they notice the what in our life. They don't know our intention. They just see our actions. After they see our actions, then they ask the question, why did you do that? And man, that opens a door up for a gospel dialogue there. Because I serve a Savior that has filled me with His Spirit. He has forgiven my sins. He loves me with an everlasting love. And He's asked me to tell others about this wonderful gift that He is offering the world. Would you want to know more about this? And you don't even have to talk that. You could just live that in front of others. Trust me, they will come to you and ask. But they have to notice. And it all comes from goodness. We are to be full of goodness. What good things do we have in our own strength? I've heard a lot of people say this. They'll say, well, I know this person. They're such a good person. I don't think God would ever send good people to hell. Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Hell was made for Satan and devils and demons. You know, when we were created, this is how come we have a wonderful immune system, if you ever think about this. When we were created, our bodies were to heal themselves. We were created to live forever. We were never created to live 80, 90 years and die. That was not God's original intent. But Satan wanted to screw that all up, came down and tempted us. And guess what? A bad act was done. An act that was not good, disobeying the very word of God. And from that, we are reaping the harvest of the seed we planted, the seed of sin. We are to be full of goodness because the world is living in sin. Amen. And we are the people that can show them the other way to life. Lastly, we are to be good to others. We cannot be good to others if we're not full of goodness. We cannot offer to somebody else what we do not ourselves have. And so... If we're going to offer somebody a good thing, then we must be the partakers of that. We must already have something if we're going to offer it to somebody else. I think a lot of times the church does a disservice to itself. There's too many people in churches, perhaps, that have a that when people look at those people, they say, and they've been attending that church for 30, 40 years. And the community sees this person doing whatever they're doing that's wrong. And they try to justify it and rationalize it, but the world's looking and saying, I cannot believe that person thinks they're a godly person. They think they're a Christian one of them holy roller types, you know? And they talk that way. They act that way. 
And I think it really hurts the family of God. When you leave this place, are you the same person? That's a question for you to answer. Or do you take off your Christian garb, your church activity, and you just sit it over here and then live your life like you want to Monday through Saturday, and then on Sunday you come over here and pick up your your Christianity again and garb yourself and come in here. I can tell you, after going to church all my life, I was going to church before I was born. I was blessed. I had parents that cared. They brought me to church. And, and it's, it's amazing that you can get to a point to where I know how to talk. I know the hymns, frontwards and backwards, because I used to play them for years, as well as sing them. Oh, I've heard so many prayers prayed, I could write a beautiful one and fake you all out that I really know what I'm doing. I could teach you in five minutes how to bullet point a sermon from a scripture. I could teach you how to do this thing we call pastorate, you know, pastor work. But at the end of the day, that's not what God wants. You know what God wants? He wants real people, that that's their life. You're not faking it. You're not faking a Christian life. You're actually living a Christian life. And along with that is on occasion, we as Christian people will make mistakes and sin against each other. I'm sorry, I don't care. I, I'm from a holiness movement. I've heard all those sermons on holiness. I also believe that there's always an ability for us to sin while we walk this soil. But there's always forgiveness for sin. And God expects us to sanctify that sin when we have sinned. If we confess, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. And John was talking to believers. We are not to live in sin. But do not think for a moment that I can go to the altar once and get saved, go to the altar twice and get sanctified, and then that's all there is. I can just sit and saturate for the rest of my life. I've had people preach those sermons to me. That it's the second work of grace, that sanctification. I'm thinking, well, that's fine. You can sanctify yourselves and set yourself apart for the Lord. But if maybe I'm just weak, but I have to go back and get filled up on a regular basis. Because the world wants to suck that life right out of you. The devil wants to do everything he can to trip you up. And it robs us of making good decisions. If the devil can just get in our mind a little bit and convince us to move over just an inch a day, after a while we're way over to the other side of the wall and we say, how do we get there? I don't understand. It's just a little bit of time. God is the source of our goodness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Points to ponder as we leave. We don't always feel like being good to others. But we always want others to be good to us. Isn't that funny? I'm going to treat you like garbage, but man, I want you to treat me nice. Did you ever have those people? Did you ever have a salesman call you up on the phone and act real mean to you? Man, they call me up and act like my best friend. I think, I don't know you from Adam, you know? But hey, they call me up. Want to act real chipper? Sometimes I'll toy with them a little bit and I'll say I'm not interested. But most of the time I just don't want to waste their time because I'm not interested in a new roof. I just had one put on. Don't need a new roof. But they call up and they have a reason for acting that way. How many of us would want to have somebody call us up and treat us mean and then want us to buy their product? It was, it was hilarious. Um, when I go to buy a car, I always search out 
I, I call I call around and the last car I bought had a real had a really great salesman when I bought my truck. He was really friendly. And while we were there, he just got done waiting on somebody. And while we were getting signing papers in a financial office, he had another person at his desk. And when we were leaving, there were two more people ready after he was done with them. This guy was busy. Why? Because if I took you down there right now, you'd see a person that genuinely wants to sell you a car. And he'll do what he has to do, sell you a car. And he's concerned about selling cars. We need to be concerned about discipling people in the Lord. And the only way we can do that is to live that out in their life, in front of them, so they can see it. We need to be good to others. The second thing, we don't always treat God good, but expect Him to always treat us good. Sometimes we just say, yeah, I've had a bad week, had a bad month, had a bad six months, and we're able to go, but we just say, nah, i just not into God for a while. You know, I've had some things happen in my life. I don't think it's very fair, God. Here I go to church every week. I sing in your church. I maybe even teach a Sunday school class, maybe on this board or that board, and I'm doing all this stuff for you, and you allow this to happen to me in my life. I can't believe you do that. What's up with you, God? Don't tell me you haven't thought that on occasion. And so we take it out on God. And really, what it's like, it's like giving someone else, giving ourselves poison and expecting God to get sick. It's not going to work. We're hurting ourselves. Sometimes we don't treat God with the same goodness that he treats us with. Thirdly, being good is not always easy, but it is always worth it. It's always worth it. I don't know. Um, there's not a decision I made when I was a teenager. There was a lot of... I, I, was, I, tend, I was a rather boring teenager. I wanted to grow up too quick. There's a part of me that resents every word that I just said. I, I should have acted out more and maybe enjoyed my life a little bit more, but I was an old man in a teenage body. I wanted to sing in the adult choir. and I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's just I wanted to grow up too fast. And, and when you're, But I can honestly look back at my life now and I say, just maybe that most likely kept me from getting into all kinds of trouble. Just might have, because I surely had a whole bunch of opportunities to get in some trouble. I really did. Oh, I could have gotten in trouble, made my parents real proud. Could have. But there was a part of me, even before I was saved, that said, that's not good. That's the convicting goodness of the Holy Spirit being merciful to me in my life and saying, you need to get out of this situation. And I were listened most of the time because I definitely was not perfect. I listened most of the time, like all of us. Do we always listen? <laughs> well, if we do, we need to have a sermon on lying. <laughs> the lastly, being good is not always popular, but it is always godly. For us sitting here, that is our goal. It's not to be popular. God wants us to be holy, godly, whatever word you want to put in there. Right with him. And you know something, when I look out here and I see you folks, this Harvest Point's been great to me, and I tell you, I am so proud to be a pastor here. I look out and I see new faces that were, are here today that even weren't here six months ago. What a joy it is to watch growth in the family of God. But folks, as, as, as hard as it is to get people to come in here and be part of our family, it's so easy to do some ungood things. How you like that word? <laughs> and you can lose several in one day. And it might take you a year to get them back. It's so important that we live a holy, good life in front of people. We can fill this place up.
That's my goal. That's what God wants us to do. Go out today and throughout the rest of your life and do good things for God. He'll bless you for it. Let us pray.